Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Hello, everybody. My name is John Hamry. We've got an audience that's building as people are getting admitted into, into the room. And so we'll just, uh, let me just say a few words of welcome before we turn to this remarkable panel that we're going to have the opportunity to listen to today. Um, I want to welcome you all to this day two of the U.S. Innovation Competitiveness Summit. Uh, and this is our, this is going to be exciting today because we're talking about a topic that uh, I've never covered here at CSIS, uh, but it's so vital to our national security, it's vital to our economy, and that is intellectual property. Um, you know, everything in the world that you see that was created by human hands, everything, started off initially as just an idea in one person's mind. It's a remarkable thing when you think about it. One person, whether it's the idea of a microphone, whether it's the shape of a glass, whether it's the, uh, the, the construction of a table, whatever, everything is the product of one person's mind thinking of it and then sharing it in ways with other people to turn it into reality. Um, that's a remarkable thing, and it is a precious thing as to the foundation of our economy. The intellectual property system is designed to strike a balance between what's good for society and what's good for the inventor. And it's a rich, robust, and well-developed system, but not well understood. And we're going to dig into that today. It's going to be a very exciting time with all of you. So I, I want to say thank you to Andre Anku uh, and this remarkable panel. Let me just say a word of introduction to Andre. He's going to run this session. Uh, you know, Andre is an example of why America benefits so much from immigration. You know, he, he came to this country as a young kid planning to become an engineer did become an engineer, was an engineer at Hughes Aircraft Company. Uh, but then he became interested in the world of patents and intellectual property, became a recognized leader while working at uh, Iroll and Man Manila, I think is the firm, is a, it's a premier intellectual property firm. Uh, and in that role, he was very involved uh, in the, the community of lawyers uh, and intellectuals that think about and deal with intellectual property. Uh, he was nominated by President Trump to be Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Director of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, confirmed unanimously by the Senate, I should say. And he's done a remarkable job. He and Walt Copan uh, came to me in January and said they wanted to sustain momentum behind the ideas they had been working. And that's the origin of renewing American innovation, this project we have at CSIS. Today, we have this rare opportunity. I'm going to be learning today. This is a marvelous opportunity for me and for all of us. So I welcome you. And Andre, let me turn to you and to say thank you for, for being the leader on this and thank you for leading this session. And I, I'm excited to hear everybody's uh, pr presentations today. Thank you, Andre. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Hamry, for that uh, very generous uh, introduction. And uh, really, thank you for providing a home at CSIS for the Renewing American Project, Amer American Innovation Project, and uh, the support uh, for uh, this super important issue um, uh, in uh, current uh, in the current in the current state of the American economy. By the way, um, to your point, John, that uh, I balance uh, between the interests of society and um, interests of the inventors or the creators. Um, of course, uh, James Madison in Federalist uh, 43 said that uh, the intellectual property clause, which arises from the Constitution, uh, is uh, equally beneficial uh, to both. And that's why he said and concluded uh, that uh, the utility of this power 
the constitutional power to, uh, granted to Congress to cr uh, create intellectual property rights, patents, and copyright. In James Madison's views, that uh, power will scarcely be questioned. Uh, now, I don't know if that's proven to be true. I think it is being questioned all the time. And um, but uh, certainly the utility, uh, it, it cannot be uh, in doubt to, uh, to, to the importance of innovation. Um, before we get to the panel, let me say a few words to set the stage as to, um, uh, as to why we are talking about these issues nowadays. The news, to be frank, in recent weeks has been stark. General Motors shuts down virtually all North American plants uh, for about two weeks. Think about that. When was the last time that General Motors shuts down all of its plants and why did it do that? Because there's a shortage in the United States and frankly worldwide of computer chips, silicon chips. And this is not only for cars. Certainly it's being, it's applied to cars. So cars right now, whether they're GM cars or whatever uh, other brand, um, they are on back order because there is a shortage of silicon chip supplies. But in addition to that, refrigerators, dishwashers, everything is in short supply right now. And we are not in, um, you know, um, this is not a world war situation. There's a shortage of computer chips in the United States. What happened? The United States was the forefront of the Silicon Revolution. So, um, so, so that is a question that it just is one of the latest issues in the news right now that is prompting us to rethink um, all of issues surrounding American innovation and the American economy. It is my view that the United States right now is being outdone in strategy, technology, and manufacturing on a whole host of technologies and most such as silicon chips, um, especially the manufacturing side. And, but more importantly, in technologies of the future, whether we are talking 5G or 6G communications, whether we are talking about uh, crypto, um, crypto type technologies, artificial intelligence and the like, by any measure uh, that we can count, we know that now it is up to us on some of these technologies to come from behind. Let me give you some examples. In the technologies that matter, China right now issues many more patents than the United States. When I mean that technologies is matters, technologies that are at the forefront of the next technological revolution. So that's patents, that's one measure. Easiest for me to talk about as the former director of the Patent and Trademark Office. Um, but it's not just patents. If we look at technical publications in scientific and, um, and engineering peer reviewed journals, uh, China outperforms the United States. The number of PhD graduates in science and engineering with science and engineering degrees, we are falling behind. When it comes to leadership of standard setting committees around the world, the United States is losing its edge. So well beyond semiconductors, when we talk about 5G, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, the United States needs to up its game. For us to maintain our technical lead, which we have been used to for the past couple hundred of years, we must double down and affect change. Frankly, something has to change. The trajectory we have been on in recent years has to change. I liken it to the need in the United States for another Sputnik moment. By that, I mean, looking back a few decades during the, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, beginning of the Cold War, when, it, when the Soviet Union launched the first satellite in space named Sputnik, the United States realized 
that we must compete. And we had leadership at that time. President Kennedy went in front of the, of the nation and declared that by the end of the decades, that was the 1960s, we as a nation shall put a man on the moon. And then the national concentration focused towards that goal. Are our leaders today willing to make the, that type of commitment and lead us in a direction where we will once again have the technical lead in these really critically important technologies? There are lots of issues that go into this. And throughout the week, CSIS and the Renewing American Innovation Project has been focusing on a variety of such issues, such as technology transfer um, and, uh, and the like. But here is the bottom line. We need to identify as a nation all the various issues, whether it's education, whether it's diversity and more folks from uh, traditionally underrepresented groups participating, whether it is uh, immigration, uh, when it comes to folks with uh, STEM degrees, whether it is funding, private and pr public sector funding for research and development. All these issues need to be addressed as a nation. The United States needs an innovation policy to address to identify and address a whole host of issues. And of course, we need better intellectual property policies. Why? Because it is my firm belief that intellectual property drives innovation. For innovation in the United States to be successful, we need the private sector to be involved and not just involved but to lead in new technologies of the future. In order for the private sector to participate at its maximum capacity, the private sector has to be assured of the protections provided by intellectual property laws in order to uh, incentivize and protect the investments made. Innovation does not just happen as some argue. Innovation is driven first and foremost by investment and investment needs of time and capital. And, in, and that investment needs the protection of intellectual property laws. So on this, in this part of the CSIS um, uh, Innovation Week, for this program, we're gonna focus on those intellectual property policies, what has happened over the past decade or so, uh, what's been good, what needs to be improved, and what specifically do we need to focus on for, uh, for the future. So with that, let me introduce our incredibly distinguished panel. Um, and we have four remarkable leaders in this field, two from the judiciary and two from, uh, from the administration side. And uh, let, me, uh, let me just introduce them alphabetically. Uh, so with that, uh, uh, first let me introduce uh, uh, Drew Hirschfeld. Um, uh, Drew, uh, I had the privilege of working with Drew when, uh, when I was uh, director of the PTO. And of course, uh, he has served uh, with multiple directors over a very long and distinguished career uh, at the PTO. Drew right now, his title is uh, Performing the Functions and Duties of under Secretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Director of the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, I used to think that I have the longest title in government, but I'm quite certain that Drew now absolutely takes, uh, takes uh, the honors for that. Um, uh, in addition to this, uh, Drew is the Commissioner for Patents. That means he leads the, uh, the patents organization. He's been doing that for uh, five plus years. He was uh, appointed to that position by my predecessor, Director Michelle Lee, and, um, uh, uh, and the Secretary of Commerce at that time. And uh, he was reappointed when I was the director uh, just last year for a second term. And this is incredibly unusual and a testament uh, to Drew's um, uh, performance and uh, leadership 
uh, of at the United States PTO for a long time. He started in 1994 uh, as an examiner and uh, worked his way up through many, many different uh, administrations. Uh, uh, then uh, let me introduce David Kapos. Um, Dave uh, is a predecessor of mine. He was uh, director of the Patent and Trademark Office from 2009 to 2013. Uh, he currently is a partner at, uh, at Cravath, a law firm uh, in uh, New York City. Um, and uh, before all of that, he had a long and distinguished career at IBM, including chief IP counsel. He was at IBM for 25 years. Uh, the list of accomplishments uh, that Dave has and, uh, and honors um, before and after the, uh, his service at the PTO is, uh, is too long to mention. Uh, let me just say that uh, he is an inspiration because uh, he's been out of the PTO office for almost 10 years, but uh, stays active and super involved in all of these discussions and continues to be one of the most important leaders in this space on an ongoing basis. Um, by the way, Drew also worked with Dave. I think Drew was, at least at some point, Dave's chief of staff, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah. Um, and then let me introduce uh, Judge um, Michelle. Judge Michelle, are you online yet? Yes, I am. All right, fantastic. Uh, Judge Michelle was for 22 years uh, at the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, the last six of which um, he served as the chief judge of, uh, of the circuit. He authored during that time more than 800 opinions. I need to calculate how many a day that, that makes, but in any event, uh, that's quite a record. Um, since uh, he has uh, retired from the court, he does a lot of writing, a lot of public speaking. He is a great supporter of intellectual property rights. Like David uh, in private life, Judge Michel has not shied away from uh, uh, providing leadership in the IP sector. And uh, he likewise is an inspiration. Before he was on the court, he was an assistant district attorney in Philadelphia, had many other uh, jobs also in the US government. And he also served as counsel for Senator Specter um, uh, at that time. Uh, last and not least, uh, and sorry, Judge, it's uh, just the alphabet, uh, Judge uh, Kathleen O'Malley. She is a sitting judge um, currently at uh, the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Uh, she was appointed by President Obama in 2010. Uh, before that, uh, Judge O'Malley was um, uh, a district court judge in the Northern District of Ohio, where she was appointed by President Clinton in 1994. And um, uh, to this day, I believe she remains the only uh, judge at the Federal Circuit who has had district court uh, experience. And I can tell you how uh, uh, important that added perspective uh, is that Judge O'Malley brought to the Court of Appeals. Uh, she also worked for the Attorney General's Office in the state of Ohio before she was appointed to the bench and she started her career as a lawyer in private practice um, uh, in Ohio. So with that, let me uh, start uh, uh, the questions of the panel. I'll be the moderator. Um, and I want to touch upon uh, some of the hottest and most important issues right now in intellectual property law that we need to uh, to address as a nation. Um, and let me start with uh, Drew, who um, uh, is the acting, the, the current leader of the, uh, of the office. Um, Drew, this week we are about to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the America Invents Act, the AIA, uh, which uh, passed, uh, was signed by President Obama I think on September 16th, 2011. That law was one of the biggest changes or the biggest change in uh, patent law since 1952. And it had quite a few components to it. Um, maybe you can reflect for a minute about what, this, uh, what the AIA has meant 
how has it performed in the last decade? And what are the hot issues surrounding the AIA at this point, 10 years in? Sure, well, thank you. Happy to uh, address those points, Andre. Let me start off by thanking CSIS uh, for having me. And it is quite an honor for me to be on this panel. Um, as Andre said, uh, two members of the panel were, were my bosses who I've learned a great deal from. So uh, particular thanks to Andre and, and Dave for, for all you've done uh, helping me in my career. So uh, as Andre mentioned, the AIA uh, anniversary, the 10 year anniversary is coming up in, in two days. So the, I've been reading a lot about it and there's been a lot of discussion about the uh, AIA. And let me just, uh, if I may, just go through some of the key changes uh, that, that were uh, implemented 10, you know, starting with 10 years ago. And by the way, uh, Dave Kapos uh, was, was director at the time and was really instrumental in, in moving all of these issues forward. So special uh, kudos goes, goes to Dave for his efforts. Um, but one of the biggest changes, and perhaps at the time 10 years ago, we thought was the most controversial was the change of the, the whole US uh, IP system to a uh, first to file system uh, from a first to invent system. And uh, up to that point, the US was one of the only places that was first to invent. So this was a, a significant change. Uh, I will say looking back 10 years later and having the ability of, of hindsight, uh, certainly did not pan out to be as controversial as people thought it was and as troublesome as people thought it was. Sure, people had to change uh, some of their practices and get ready. And there were new, new laws and rules put in place. But this does seem the intent here was to add certainty and to better align us with some of our foreign partners. And it certainly seems to have accomplished that. Um, addition, an additional change of the AIA was that it gave the USPTO uh, fee setting authority. And I will tell you as a longtime uh, employee of the PTO, um, that should not be uh, underestimated as, as having a, a great benefit for, for all of us. The ability for PTO to be uh, able to set our fees, to, to be able to gauge what work we have coming in, what we're going to need to do as an agency, uh, and to be able to set the fees and keep the money um, uh, to, really has helped us be, be most, most effective and efficient as, as an agency. That was a, certainly a, a huge uh, change. Um, additionally, with the AIA, we had the, uh, the uh, ability to create regional offices, and we've created four uh, regional offices uh, throughout the country. And I have an interesting perspective here because I will tell you that I was on the original planning of Detroit, our first office, in terms of the structure of that office. And I, and I share this with people all the time. Uh, when we were planning it, we were planning really for examiners to be there and the operations of, of having patent examiners, what would they do? And I will tell you what we really missed and what we've learned in the, in the last decade is the amount of outreach that those regional offices provide. Uh, it really was quite eye-opening and uh, fascinating. And, and as Andre said, you know, he wants us to, to look back and look forward. Um, looking back, the, the creation of the regional offices was absolutely fantastic, helping us with our nationwide workforce. But, but more so, even the outreach has just been an absolute uh, uh, boon to, to all of the US. And I will tell you, as we look forward, the more outreach education we can all do, uh, the better I'm sure we'll probably get into that. Um, a couple other changes uh, by the uh, AIA were the creation of a pro bono program, which is still being scaled up and, and has really enabled people who don't have the means to be able to represent themselves to get assistance. And I think that has been a great change. I'd love to see uh, additional work being done there. Uh, and then the final change I'll talk about is the creation of the Patent Trial and Appeal Board. Um, uh, prior to the AIA, uh, we had judges at the USPTO, the judges would hear ex parte appeals from examiners' actions. So if an examiner rejected a patent application, uh, the judges would hear that. But with the creation of the AIA, it gave uh, the ability for people to challenge um, an issued patent and um, so, so judges now have, have that dual role uh, where the PTAB rather has that dual role to be able to uh, handle both of those. The intent here was that the uh, AIA trials uh, are cheaper, faster alternatives to district court litigation. So I'm really proud of, of the way uh, we've implemented all of those provisions. Um, as Andre said, he wants us to look forward. Uh, so one area that I think we uh, definitely need to look forward at and, and is probably a uh, uh, one of the most uh, 
heated issues of debate uh, today is some of the rules and, and regulations regarding the patent trial and appeal board and these AIA trials uh, that I mentioned. Uh, the issue I'm most uh, particularly relating to or talking about is uh, the issue of, of uh, what's called discretionary denials. Um, this is uh, actually was written into the statute that the director of the US USPTO has the ability to accept or deny petitions to challenge a patent. Um, and uh, there's a lot of discussion to, uh, that has been taken place about what those denials should, should, what form they should take. And I know there's been a lot of movement to uh, put denials into place to prevent harassment of a patent owner. Uh, for example, if there's multiple petitions being filed, um, if there's uh, either multiple at the same time or multiple in succession, uh, if there's concurrent litigation going on. Uh, so anyway, I flag this as being a, a very uh, hotly discussed item and something that needs focus and attention moving forward. Uh, last thing I'll say about that, and I'll kick it back to Andre is, uh, I know that uh, relatively recently we came out with a request for comments uh, to get people's views on this, and we received over 800 comments in response from the public, which is you know, way beyond what we normally receive, and there's very differing views on how we should move forward. So this is uh, certainly an area that we should be focusing on moving forward. Thanks, uh, Drew. Really good uh, background in history and also the hottest issues uh, that you identify. Uh, just to pick up on the last point uh, you made, um, I believe the office put out a summary, um, an executive summary of sorts, uh, just a few pages of the 800 or so comments, right? It's available on the website someplace. Yes, so, so there is a summary available, and if people are interested in reading any of the 800 or all of the 800 plus comments, you can do that as well. It's all available on our website. Uh, can you give folks, uh, and, and the answer might be no, you can't, but can you give uh, folks a sense of the, um, the motivations, not the motivations, but the crux of the uh, arguments on the two sides on, uh, uh, of, of the issue um, of multiple uh, petitions at the office? Um, uh, what, is, what are the main arguments? Uh, on the various sides and 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 motivations behind them. Sure. So so on the one hand, um, you have um, many members of the public that feel that they should be able to bring um, you know whatever uh, challenges that that they would like to, and that that fits within the, the guidelines of the AIA. Um, so whether that's multiple petitions again at the same time or, or in serial or even with concurrent litigation um, uh, with district court. And on the other side, um, you, have, uh, you have the feeling that um, we should be limiting these so as to um, make the PTAB truly an alternative, a cheaper, faster alternative, not let it be used in a, in a harassing way. And I'm being careful trying not to pass uh, judgment, although I do definitely believe that the office should take uh, steps to prevent any type of harassment. Um, I think we want the, the issues to be decided on, on the merits and, and not be a, a deep pockets type of issue. So um, again, I think these are, are, are the, 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 the issues, Andre. And of course, given that there's 800 comments, there's the whole spectrum is covered. There's like lots of things in between, uh, right? And, Absolutely. Um, so so um, uh, look, not, not to put you on the spot, so I'll offer uh, a, a thought here as a general principle, why this is important to the United States, right? Um, it is somewhat of an ops for, for the general public, for all of us who are in the midst of it, dealing with this every single day, it's become secondhand. Um, uh, the issue has, but um, it's somewhat obscure and technical for the rest of the public. But the bottom line is, with respect to patents, which are basically commercial instruments, um, uh, uh, certainty, predictability uh, is important to them uh, for everyone in industry. It's important to the patent owner uh, to know what their rights are, generally speaking, so that they can make appropriate investments in their uh, technology that's uh, protected by this IP. And for the, uh, for the competitors, 
Uh, it's important to know what the patents are and exactly what they mean so that they can work around them or take licenses to them, um, uh, whatever the need uh, is at that time. So anytime when there is a level of uncertainty or uh, multiple serial potential challenges that might give inconsistent results and the like, it makes the uh, system, uh, the commercial system somewhat unpredictable uh, and perhaps as a result will attract less investment, uh, both of capital and human talent in those particular areas of technology. So it's really important to dial this just right. Um, and it is a dial. Um, uh, so you have to, you know, uh, you have to consider the entire spectrum. And it's important to dial this just right in order to make sure that the United States uh, investment and innovation communities uh, are, are hitting on all cylinders in all areas of technology um, uh, to make sure that we don't disincentivize anyone. And in fact, we provide the appropriate level of incentives. So of all, out of all the AIA, of all the issues that you've mentioned, Drew, I suspect you would agree that this somehow has become like the hardest one still being debated, right? Uh, absolutely, with, with, without question, the hottest one. Um, you know, I've been in this role as as you know, performing the functions director since January, and and as as I know you well know, because you held the position prior to me, it's what you hear about ninety percent of the time of the issues. I just wanted to add, if I may, one one point um, to what you said about certainty, and I, I certainly absolutely agree uh, with with the point that you made. Um, I just like to make a, a further point that it's not only about the uncertainty of the, the validity of your patent and whether you're going to be able to retain your patent rights. Um, we have heard from many that the uncertainty is about whether they're going to be able to defend themselves um, with the cost of, of either being in, in uh, uh, AIA trials at the PTAB and potentially also in the district court, or again, if there's multiple um, uh, suits being, being filed. So the issue is also just, uh, do we have the ability, to, do people have the ability to defend themselves even when their patent, they feel very confident, will be held to be valid? Um, so anyway, that's one of the, the issues that also needs to be looked at. Costs, of course, of litigation on both sides. Correct. Uh, cost of defending yes. your patent, uh, and also costs of uh, the folks accused of uh, patent infringement of defending those against those accusations. So the overall cost of litigation, which is a cost on the entire innovation system uh, it needs to be appropriately uh, considered as well. All right, well, hey, thank you very Andre, much. Just, yeah, just please. before we go on, can I offer a comment, having please. been directly involved in putting the legislation together with members of Congress and their staff, what we were thinking and um, trying to solve for at the time the AIA was put together with respect to this particular point in the PTAB um, was we knew that there would be any amount of um, uh, strategic behavior by parties on all sides of PTAB procedures, um, patent holders, as well as those seeking uh, PTAB reviews. And we knew that there would be um, a, a, a attempts or, or there would be conflicts with ongoing litigation and so we specifically wanted to provide the office with flexibility to use judgment that you can't legislate to recognize those situations where district courts um, are already involved, where the federal circuit is already involved, where multiple procedures are already uh, underway and where the better part of valor, even as much as the USPTO wants to uh, be an adjudicator and wants to correct its errors if there are errors or affirm patents if they should be affirmed. The better part of valor is to have the flexibility to make good decisions, if you will, in the moment. And that was what that provision was meant for. Um, I find myself feeling like the debates we're having over it now are testament to how important it is that that kind of discretion uh, remain with the office and, uh, and there be flexibility. Because at the end of the day, no one's being denied their rights. They're being told, take this fight to the Article Three courts, take it to Judge O'Malley, take it to the district courts. They've got 200 plus years experience adjudicating these kinds of disputes. They can do, and they do do a perfectly fine job of it. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dave. Um, 
And uh, uh, thanks for that, th those comments. Um, and um, I encourage everyone on the panel to please jump in at any time on the other uh, uh, topics uh, that folks are speaking on. I also want to encourage the audience to send us questions. Um, this uh, uh, session was scheduled for an hour and a half. Uh, we have another uh, 55 minutes or so. And um, uh, please feel free to put your comments in the Q&A uh, or in the chat and uh, we'll try to, uh, to get to them during the program. Okay, let me uh, now turn to a different topic uh, that's of really uh, significant importance. And I'm gonna ask uh, Judge O'Malley to take the lead uh, on this topic. And that is uh, with respect to the issue of injunctions because the entire IP system, um, certainly patents and copyrights stems from the constitutional grant of the power uh, to Congress, uh, which says that uh, Congress has the right to give to inventors and authors their exclusive right to their respective writings and inventions. So Judge O'Malley, let me just start with a provocative question, but then you can say anything you would like, which is how can an exclusive right be enforced without an exclusive type, an, exclu an exclusionary type of a remedy like an injunction? Yeah, well, I, I don't think it can completely. I, I think that's part of the problem. I think that that the, both the framers of the Constitution and those who passed the Patent Act did have in mind that that exclusionary right was one of the things that, that went along with the grant of a patent. And up until 2006, it was at least presumed that if there was um, an infringement of a valid patent, that there would be irreparable harm and that the, while the court still retained discretion not to grant an injunction, um, it, was a, it was heavy lifting for the, the one who was found to be an infringer of a valid patent to, to overcome that presumption. Um, in 2006, the Supreme Court took a case called eBay um, and the Supreme Court in a, in a shockingly short opinion, um, looked at the case below and said, all right, the district court said, I'm not gonna issue an injunction because you choose to license your patents to some people. And then the Court of Appeals said, no, that's too extreme. But the Court of Appeals at, at the time, the CAFC said, um, the, the general rule is that you get your injunction. Now that wasn't the way the, the federal circuit really had acted, but I think it was reacting to the extreme nature of the district court decision. The Supreme Court took the case and said, no, patents are just like every other property right. Um, and despite the fact that both the constitution and the patent act talk about the right to exclude or the exclusive right to manufacture, uh, sell, offer for sale, use, um, we're, we're going to say that you still need to apply a, a four-factor test, an equity test, uh, which considers the likelihood of success on the merits, the, it, whether the harm is irreparable, the, uh, the balancing of interests between the parties and the public interest, uh, and said, therefore, going forward, there's no absolute right to exclude. Uh, it's up to the district court to apply the general rules of equity. The problem, a couple problems with that opinion. One is that um, it, it included the balancing of interest factor, which had never been included uh, at the end of a trial with respect to a permanent injunction. That was only a, a preliminary injunction. Um, and and they, so they even didn't get their own four factor test quite right. Uh, but, but the other problem with the opinion is that it has been interpreted as having swung the pendulum in the opposite direction to the point that it's very difficult to get an injunction. Uh, before eBay, the infringers or alleged infringers knew that they had a risk that they would be completely out of business if, if they um, decided to infringe and went forward and were found to infringe, that they had the, the risk of losing their business Without that risk, you end up basically having essentially efficient infringement. In other words, individuals and parties can infringe 
and know that at the end of the day, all they're probably going to do is pay the same license fee or royalty fee that they would have paid had they agreed to do it up front rather than um, be found to, to be an infringer of a valid patent. Now, I'm not saying you can never get an injunction. Um, th there are injunctions that issue. Uh, it, they usually only issue where there are direct competitors and where the, the competition in the market is such that, that a sale to the infringer would be a non-sale to, um, to the patent holder. Uh, but short of that, we very often don't see injunctions being entered. Um, I once was at an international conference where uh, Sir Robert Jacobs from the UK said that, that that decision, the Supreme Court's decision in eBay was the thing that started the slide uh, to in terms of the preeminence of the United States and its intellectual property um, position. You can get automatic injunctions in Germany Injunctions are not automatic in the UK, but they're pretty close. You, you can get injunctions pretty easily in China. You can get injunctions all over the world, except apparently in the United States. Um, I, there are a number of other problems I think are posed by this. It's not just the efficient infringement issue, but it's also we have now have a, a, an obsessive uh, attention on damages awards and the effort to get huge damages uh, to replace uh, the the right to an injunction uh, has has caused a lot of uh, controversy as well because the damage numbers in the U.S. are are so large and it's because that is the primary remedy at this point in time. So I can talk about a lot of other aspects of this, but it's it to me it's it's a mistake. It was, I think it was the Supreme Court's reaction uh, to the notion that, that, that someone would think their four-factor equity test didn't apply in a particular circumstance. Um, and they even, in that opinion, um, said that, that this is what they, they, that it's always applied that way to copyright cases. Now, most copyright experts will tell you they didn't know that until the eBay decision. Uh, but since then, clearly in the copyright field, the courts have said eBay changed the landscape and, and injunctions are far more difficult to get even in the copyright era. Let, let me ask you, thank you for the comments. Um, uh, let, let me ask, a, uh, you raised so many good points and I'm going to follow up on a few of them. But first of all, at a higher level. Why, for, for if, we, if we look at the broader innovation ecosystem, in the United States, why does this particular remedy have an impact um, on potentially the investment uh, and innovation, uh, investment in innovation uh, and R&D and the like? Um, I mean, I don't personally, I don't think it's a coincidence that the founders in the constitution itself put exclusive right they, 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 they could have said you can create an IP system. They didn't have to say the exclusive right. But they clearly thought back then that this is the crux. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, it's a sentence long. The, uh, the IP clause in the Constitution is a sentence long. And this is what they focused on. Um, so obviously they were onto something, but what is it exactly that is making the difference here to the underlying innovation ecosystem, you think? Well, I think, you know, if, if you go all the way back to the constitution, Madison had a vision of, of the intellectual property system that was, was very much a democratic one. He wanted to make sure that, that, that everybody in the United States, and at that point, there were mostly poor people in the United States who had any kind of creative idea could uh, be incentivized to, um, to follow those ideas and to implement them. And not everybody had the money or the wherewithal to, to effectuate their ideas, but they, they had the ability to license them and to actually earn a living from their own creativity. And that was the idea behind the patent system in the very beginning, and, and it worked. I mean, our economy, our then nascent economy really took off because we had you know, farmers and even slaves being creative 
uh, because there was the ability at, at, to, um, to protect their inventions. And I won't get into the issue about uh, at what point were slaves allowed to have their own patents, but they were able to uh, effectuate their inventions through, through their, their owners at the time. But we had a broad swath of people who, who we were able to tap into. I think what happens now is if you're not a big company who can afford to, to withstand litigation till the, till the end of the day and hopefully get some money at the end, you don't feel that you have those protections. If you have a university, if you have an individual inventor, I mean, they, if they don't have the money and the wherewithal to fight that efficient infringer, then, then their incentive to continue uh, to be creative dissipates. And that's what I think the problem is. I think we have lost the vision um, that originally prompted uh, the constitutional provision and the original patent acts, and even frankly is supposed to underlie the current patent act. But it, I think we have lost it by not understanding the importance of protecting everybody who would be an inventor. Of course, the argument on the other side is that uh, you're being compensated, the inventor, at the end of the day, if, if they prevail, they're compensated anyway. Why in the world would you take somebody else out of the market if they're forced by the court order uh, to pay damages, royalties, and the like? Why isn't it better for the public at that point to allow multiple competitors to go on as long as the inventor gets the money? Again, this is completely at odds with a con constitutional concept of an exclusive right. But if the small inventor or whoever, the university or whoever the inventor is, gets compensated anyway, why not let everybody do it at that point? Well, that, that sort of ignores the reality of, of litigation, number one. Uh, there's always a threats in litigation in terms of what might happen, what a jury might decide, what a judge might decide, what the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court might decide. And there's also the, you know, the, um, the, the impact of having to live through very expensive, you know, it's like the baton death march sometimes when you're talking about complex litigation. And not every small inventor has the wherewithal to withstand that without themselves going out of business before they ever can get to that award at the end of the day. Um, so I think that that by saying that, oh, what's, what's the problem if you can get the money at the end of the day, the problem is, is that you have, um, you have too many would-be inventors uh, who can't withstand the system uh, and, and aren't able, and it also, frankly, prevents settlements of cases. I mean, when I was a district court judge before eBay, it was a lot easier to settle uh, complex litigations, including patent cases, because that threat of an injunction hung over the heads of the uh, alleged infringers. Without that, there's no incentive to settle. You can say, because all you do at the end of the day is pay what would have been a reasonable royalty. And, and so I think that it really does impact uh, certainly the smaller inventors. Yeah, paradoxically, it actually has made the system more expensive and more complicated, not less. And But before I turn to Dave Kapos on a similar issue, let me just add uh, a perspective here with, in answer to my own question as to what's wrong with it, um, which is one of the main points of the patent system, as Judge O'Malley said, is to enable everyone to participate. In particular, it enables the disruptive technologies on the edges. And those are ultimately the ones on the grand scale that, that move us forward. It, it enables the little guy, the upstart, to compete against the established firms. It enables capital to flow to the new small companies to compete against the established firms. Even if you compensate with dollars, and you allow everyone to compete at that point, then the step you haven't you haven't enabled the upstart to compete against the established firm, because the established firm will then just go ahead and do it, and therefore because it has greater advantages in uh, capital size, marketing history, and so on, 
and that in the in the end removes the original incentive of the start of the upstart to begin with. Um, so um, uh, you know, I personally think remembering the constitutional premise here is critically important. On the trademark side, we passed part of the Trademark Modernization Act in December of 2020. We passed the statute that restores the presumption to an injunction uh, in the in trademark cases. Uh, Congress here with uh, might be interested in attending to the same or similar issue on the patent side. Uh, now, that, you, you did mention. Well, I just want to say one more thing. You did mention public interest, and um, there there is an ability to to say, or, or and there always had been an ability to say that the public interest is such that an injunction should not issue, even in in situations where there are direct competitors, where, for instance, the alleged infringer's product if, is is greatly beneficial to the public, like. A, a, an amazing new drug and, and actually works better than the patent holder's drug. In those instances, the court does have the discretion to deny the injunction despite the direct competition and, and to then say, but we will make sure that the patent holder is benefited uh, as we allow the competition to go forward. So it's not that the public interest doesn't come into play and it's not that the public interest wouldn't have already uh, been a factor for the court to consider pre-eBay, but it's that for some reason we assume the public interest is that, that everybody should be able to, to compete completely freely with each other regardless of the extent to which they are essentially taking each other's rights. Right. Um, excellent points. Thank you, Judge. Let me turn to uh, Director Kapos. Uh, Dave, um, uh, a special category of uh, patents or uh, a category of patents to whom the injunction discussion applies, uh, uh, especially so nowadays, is what's called standard essential patents. So rather than me setting the stage, uh, why don't I turn to you, Dave, and maybe you can explain a little bit what those types, what they are, standard essential patents, why they're important to the economy, and what is the current IP related issue that the country should address? Yeah, well, thanks. First of all, thanks Andre for inviting me to this program and thanks to the um, CSIS folks for uh, setting this up. It's really super important um, and a great discussion. So um, uh, standards of course are ubiquitous. Um, we plug our plugs into the wall and, and uh, 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 enable our railroad cars to run on tracks all over the world uh, because of standards. Standards have been around for hundreds of years, but in recent years, um, standards have become the subject of innovation and have um, extended themselves into areas uh, that are bringing together innovators and uh, putting innovators on common platforms. And we call those innovation um, driven standards. And of course, where you've got innovation, you've got intellectual property, in particular patents. And so about a generation or so ago, um, standards and patents started coming into contact with, with one another more and more. And the court started getting involved. And that's what Andre's referring to when he mentions SEPs and the IP issues that come up with SEPs. And of course, what gets complicated is that um, uh, the standard setting process brings competitors together, uh, which introduces natural antitrust concerns. And to ameliorate those more than a generation ago, um, uh, standard setting organizations and what's now known as SDO, standard development organizations, began requiring the participants to make what they call FRAND commitments. Those are commitments that they would license their patents on fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms. And there's been a tremendous amount of litigation over the years um, around many issues surrounding the FRAND debate. So that's sort of a background on, on what gets us to this point. What I would say, turning to the uh, the, the topic of the day of, you know, what, what, what have the hot issues been and what are the hot issues now and how do we look to the future involving 
SEPs and innovation driven standards, what I would say is that first of all, we need to understand that um, uh, standards driven innovation has created the most dynamic um, uh, business model that the earth, that our planet has ever known. It has created ecosystems that produce public benefit, welfare for real humans um, at all levels of all economies. And some would say even disproportionately in the least developed economies, created opportunities of truly monumental uh, proportions. So I start by, um, by stating, I don't think I have to assert because I think it's now obvious that um, standards-based innovation ecosystems, and I take the 5G in innovation ecosystem, which sits on the shoulders of the 4G and LTE innovation ecosystems that power our smartphones, and I happen to have mine right here, um, as being you know, absolutely perfect examples of the enormous spillover public benefit that results from encouraging innovators to contribute their innovations to standards. Um, the foundation of standards are the innovators and the innovations that they, I would tell you bravely, um, put into the standards uh, for their competitors to use and get equal benefit to them on the basis of maybe in the future, if the standard is successful and their patents can be upheld, maybe getting part of their, uh, of their investment back so that they can invest it in the next standard. So it's a rather brave step. And I think one that we should applaud that the innovators to the standards make. Um, there has been a lot of progress in resolving the disputes that have crept up over the last generation at this intersection between standards and patents. There was a belief that patent holders, SEP, standard essential patent holders, engaged in rampant acts of what's called hold up, um, using their patents to hold up uh, a captive industry that had agreed to implement the standard. But we have since found out because a generation of data became available that the bigger problem is hold out, which is these well-heeled implementers, um, to companies with extremely deep pockets that Judge O'Malley and, and Andre have referred to as those who engage in um, efficient infringement and effectively, if you will, thumb their noses to the patent holders, the SEP um, holders, and say, look, you can't get an injunction against me. I'm just going to infringe your patent. And the best you're going to do in court after three, four or five years and after you spend 10, 20 or $30 million is maybe you'll win and you'll get an award of damages that what I, was what I was going to have to pay you now anyway. But I get to use the money in the meantime, take some shots at your patent. I'm never going to have to pay you interest from today equal to the value of of my time uh, use of the money. So of course, I'd be committing malpractice if I didn't recommend to my CEO and my board that I infringe your patent, that I delay, delay, delay and hold out um, and maybe not pay at all or at worst pay later. So what we've learned is that the real problem is not hold up, but hold out. And it's nice to have the facts and to have the truth on that. There was a big issue about licensing level. Should we license at the so-called the component level or the level of the smallest saleable patent practicing unit? Um, and thank you to the Ninth Circuit. Um, we have learned the answer to that question, which is no, the patent holder is entitled to license at whatever efficient level it wants to license, which in the case of 5G tends to be the uh, handset level. There was the issue of royalty stacking. We were told um, by smart academics that the royalty stack would become unsustainable and would overwhelm the SEP industry. Well, data shows that that didn't happen either. The royalty stack has stayed about the same for now more than a generation. There was an issue of, um, uh, of adjunctive relief, which Judge O'Malley and, and Andre have already talked about quite a bit. And, um, uh, a view that injunctive relief should absolutely not be available in the case involving standard essential patents. Well, thank you to 
um, Andre and Macon Del Rahim and, and Walt Copan during the last administration, we got clear guidance in um, a new uh, uh, policy from the three agencies involved, uh, NIST in commerce, USPTO, of course, and the Department of Justice Antitrust Division that no, um, uh, injunctions should be available for SEPs using the very same factors that are used for any other kind of, um, of patent. So we've really settled a lot of issues in a very constructive and appropriate way. All right, uh, welcome back everybody. Uh, with apologies, uh, there was apparently a uh, technical issue with the uh, webcast. Um, uh, we are back and uh, we were in the middle of uh, uh, Dave Kapus's uh, discussion of standard essential patents. Uh, go ahead, Dave. Okay, thanks Andre. It was a good place for a break actually because I was just transitioning and saying briefly, I wanted to come back to your charge to us and mention a few of the current hot issues because while a lot has been resolved um, nicely by the courts, as well as the administration, the last administration about SEPs, there are some current hot issues. I would say global royalty rate setting is a major issue right now, probably the major issue with courts all over the world competing to be the royalty rate setters for SEPs. Um, and this has spawned an issue of global forum shopping, because if you can be in the court you like, you can get the rates set the way you like them. And that in turn has spawned um, a spate of anti-suit and anti-anti-suit injunctions, particularly involving Chinese courts in the province in, of, of Wuhan versus um, courts in India, courts in Germany, and courts in the UK and courts in the US. Um, so there's a lot to be done still in that area. We can talk about it to the extent folks want in the Q&A. But then lastly, looking forward, I would say, if there's anything we've learned um, in the last generation, it's that facts count. Getting the facts enables us to make good policy, not, getting, uh, not making policy based on anecdote or N of one, you know, one thing happens one time and we suddenly go and make policy based on that. And then perhaps most importantly, celebrating innovation. And Andre, to your point, the fact that innovation doesn't just happen, it happens because of incentives and our patent system is the incentive and it works the same way for SEP based innovation as it does for any other kind of innovation. So we need to celebrate innovation and recognize that the innovators are good guys. And we need to most importantly avoid backsliding because there are calls now with all the attacks on the IP system to move backwards and to go back to those debates of the last decade and, and even 20 years ago. And we can't let ourselves do that. We've learned from those debates, the courts have made good decisions, policymakers have good decisions. We need to move forward. So I'll stop there, thanks, Andre. Well, th thanks Dave for very insightful comments. And uh, uh, look, uh, it, uh, when it comes to standards-based innovation, as you have indicated, Dave, it's hard to underestimate and hard to, uh, over hard to overemphasize, apologies, how important it is for the technologies of the future. Because when we're talking about telecom, 5G, 6G, and beyond, artificial intelligence, more and more, these are based on standards. And if the American system does not provide the appropriate level of protection and investment and, and incentives, especially relative to our competitive competitors outside other systems, then American-based innovation will um, uh, will uh, not be able to fire on all cylinders, as we have said, and not be able to maximize itself. There's a question in the Q and A, or was before the interruption. There was a question as to why is that important to the United States? Why does the United States have to be first? Well, look, I mean, the fact of the matter is, uh, and I'll be blunt, if I have a choice between, for this particular example, standards-based technologies that are driven by the Chinese Communist Party versus being driven by American free market enterprise, you know, uh, uh, 
color me picky, but I pick the United States and I pick American innovators. Um, and I would rather live in a world where technology and the standards, where the American innovation system has a meaningful participation. Uh, so um, uh, leaving it at that, uh, so that is a critically important area, but now let me turn to the uh, last major point that's very, very hot and let's go to Judge, uh, Judge Michelle. And let me ask you, Judge, about um, uh, an area called patentable subject matter, which means effectively what creations by human beings are subject to the patent system and which creations are not subject by the, to the patent system. For example, fine arts, paintings, songs, those get copyright protection, whatever, but they don't get patent protection. Uh, certainly industrial equipment and the like is supposed to get patent protection, but some areas are very gray. Uh, and this is critically important. The statute that defines those boundaries was written in 1793 by Jefferson and Madison, has not changed since. So it's left the courts to interpret it. And what's the problem with that judge? And uh, what, what would be the proposed solution? Well, the problem is that the Supreme Court in the last decade has greatly expanded judge-made exceptions uh, to eligibility uh, for inventions falling in the four categories specified by Congress in the relevant section, Section 101. And not only have they expanded the exception so that some technologies like medical diagnostic methods are almost per se not eligible, and therefore lose the incentive of, uh, of the power of patents to justify the investments. Uh, but in other areas, uh, the recent decisions have created so much uncertainty that many decision makers, corporate executives, venture capitalists, uh, inventors, and others no longer consider patents reliable enough to justify making these uh, risky invent, uh, investments, which are slow to mature and uh, which uh, usually have to be large and repeated. Uh, so it has huge economic consequences, which I'll uh, summarize in a minute. But first, let me uh, emphasize that before the last decade, for over 100 years, there was a relatively benign, stable law of el eligibility coming out of the Supreme Court. And then suddenly, in 2012, in a case referred to as Mayo, for short, the Supreme Court upended that stable, predictable uh, eligibility regime and substituted a regime that's uh, vague, highly subjective, uh, impossible for adjudicators at all levels to apply consistently. And this has caused, uh, I think, grave harm to our innovation ecosystem. And it also has put us at big disadvantage compared to global competitors, because while the United States Supreme Court was shrinking eligibility and muddying the waters, uh, all of the countries in Europe and major countries in Asia, in, including China, we're widening and clarifying eligibility. So we've put ourselves at a disadvantage compared to our past, but also a present disadvantage uh, compared to uh, our rivals. Uh, so we have a regime now that's highly unpredictable. The outcomes are uh, not only unpredictable, but many are inconsistent with one another. Uh, and so patents are no longer trusted by those who have to commit the money, whether it's corporate money or outside investor money, like from uh, venture capitalists. And this has to shrink the incentive to invest, which is the fuel that drives the innovation ecosystem uh, to begin with. And there's already uh, considerable evidence that many smaller companies in the biotech se sector and computer implemented uh, innovations uh, have uh, gone out of business or barely uh, limping along, particularly smaller companies, startups, universities, hospitals, research institutes, engineering firms, uh, and the like. And uh, as a result of this new regime, totally judge-made with no real uh, insight or prediction into the practical economic consequences, 
the country uh, is now, uh, in my view, confronted with seven uh, different harms at the macro level. Uh, harm number one is investment capital is beginning to flee away from real technology uh, to uses not dependent on patents like entertainment, building casinos and the like. And uh, capital is beginning to fl fl flee abroad to rival countries that have wider and clearer eligibility laws and stronger enforcement systems like Europe, particularly Germany, but many others as well, and increasingly uh, even China. Uh, so uh, uh, we, we, we uh, are suffering compared to rivals uh, and compared to our own needs uh, medical diagnostic tests uh, are so important, including to combat the ongoing pandemic, uh, but we uh, badly handicapped that industry, almost destroyed it over the last decade. They made a quick recovery under the pressure of the pandemic, which is a credit to those uh, firms, but they shouldn't have had to start from a dead stand still. So uh, uh, the second problem is that the eligibility law is now frozen in place because the Supreme Court has refused to revisit uh, its 2012 Mayo case or 2014 case known as Alice, even though every year it's had large numbers of requests to revisit and revise their eligibility law, more than 60 such uh, petitions. Uh, yet another uh, harm mentioned earlier is that in the 10 advanced technologies of the 21st century, artificial intelligence and the rest enumerated earlier, uh, we're now at severe risk of losing out to China that's investing massively while we're investing less as uh, seen, for example, with regard to computer chips, also known as semiconductors, the, the proportion of venture capital presently invested in chips uh, uh, out of all the total uh, VC investment is now about one-seventh of what it was uh, a decade ago. So we're suffering in the chip area because of eligibility law as well as uh, other uh, problems. And of course, meanwhile, China, uh, not only massively investing, but making great strides technologically uh, and uh, working hard to realize its promise in its Made in China 2025 plan to surpass the U.S. in all 10 of the advanced technologies of the 21st century. Uh, and even national security is now threatened, as was recognized by the April 2021 report of the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. So uh, we have problems across the board. Uh, it was interesting to me that in a recent Senate hearing, uh, 45 true experts uh, on innovation policy and patent law testified. And out of the 45, 40, 40 out of 45 agreed that eligibility law given to us by the Supreme Court was a mess, was chaotic, was counterproductive, and needed to be fixed. But unfortunately, the Congress has uh, yet to uh, act. And uh, finally, uh, the combined effect of the restriction on injunctions, the repeat attacks on patents and the Patent Trial and Appeal Board uh, have compounded the problem of eligibility law being such uh, a mess. And of course, uh, the actors, whether it's Congress or the Supreme Court or others, uh, were not uh, able to predict all the effects and we have huge unintended and very harmful consequences. So in my view, adjustments need to be made, need to be made uh, urgently uh, and it really is a matter of a national economic, technological, and security uh, imperative. So, uh, Andre, that's uh, the summary of the sad state of U.S. Uh, law of eligibility and its many harmful practical uh, impacts that uh, threaten the future of our country, and I hope they get fixed promptly. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Judge Michel. And uh, look, uh, I said in my opening comments uh, that um, U.S. leadership uh, needs to realize uh, that we are perhaps in a new Sputnik moment here. 
uh, somebody needs to rise to the occasion and take the uh, and and take a leading role to uh, to lead the United States in the right direction, and the effects are concrete. What Judge Michel just said about the effects uh, surrounding eligibility law on silicone development manufacturing in the United States. Look what is happening right now. There is no reason for the United States, the inventor of silicon technology in the 20th century, we have a, a whole valley called Silicon Valley, um, uh, for example. For us to have a shortage to the effect that uh, major manufacturers have to close down plants should be a wake-up call. And it's not just this. As Judge Michel mentioned, uh, medical technologies of the highest importance to human health, quantum computing and the like. This is the time that the ship needs to be righted. Um, question though is, where is that leadership gonna come from? Uh, let me uh, ask Dave Kapos if you have some thoughts uh, on that question, where do we get the leadership to change this? And I ask you in particular because you were at the crux at the last very significant uh, change in patent law, as we mentioned at the beginning of the program, the AIA, is there the wherewithal? Are there leaders here now that can affect similar or even bigger changes? Mm, yeah, great question, Andre. So uh, first of all, I think the administration now needs to get involved the same way that you were involved and made changes during your administration and you know the rest of us. Um, we need a leader of the USPTO, and, and with all respect, of course, to Drew, who I absolutely love, we need a political confirmed leader um, who can, uh, you know, carry the, the weight of the administration. Um, and it's going to be very difficult until we get that. Uh, but I think that, that, that once we get that leadership, we, you know, we can make progress. Um, I, I also think that it's important that we have leadership from DOJ, particularly in that antitrust slot. Um, and uh, uh, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, the other place where we need leadership from um, is Congress. And fortunately, we've had um, senators like Senator Tillis and Senator Coons, who've been um, tremendous advocates for change and improvement. Um, but of course, as Judge Michelle points out, you know, no one's been able to get it done yet. Um, I, I think, you know, the last component where leadership is needed um, is from the private sector, from the companies that are affected and the industries that are affected to step forward more assertively, more positively um, and, and tell their story. And that to me is, is it remains a somewhat of a missing ingredient. And uh, not to forget leadership from the White House itself. Again, in the 1960s, President Kennedy standing up in front of the nation, challenging the nation uh, to a singular goal uh, when it comes to space-based innovation. That type of a call um, uh, coming from the White House um, uh, uh, I believe is urgently needed. Um, and for that, now technologies are more complex now. There's many more issues as we're hearing in this on this program alone and throughout the week. Um, and some of this more amorphous, right? It's harder to see artificial intelligence and quantum computing than a satellite, you know, which you can visualize. But nevertheless, um, to, in order to enable that, um, you know, an innovation policy uh, with a call to action from the highest leadership in the land, um, whether it's in Congress or in the White House, um, I think would make a big difference. Given the time, I wanna to turn to a, one last topic here and give Drew the um, opportunity to speak. Drew, you can comment on any of the stuff that's been said since, including 101 if, if you'd like. Um, uh, but um, uh, there was a question in the chat about uh, diversity of innovation um, uh, whether it's in the indigenous population or uh, as it's in one of the questions right now or just in general. Um, 
uh, I happen to believe this is critically important. I think this has been important for the PTO for many, many years, certainly going back to uh, Dave Stein, but even before. Uh, but now in particular, as we're facing these challenges, when we need more Americans involved, talk a little bit about not just the importance of that, but what are the, some of the practical um, uh, uh, actions that can be taken by the administration or frankly, anyone else in government? Sure, thanks, Andre. Um, actually, before I, I, I mention an answer to your question on, on diversity, I wanted to, to circle back to something um, Dave just said on, on subject matter eligibility. And I, I absolutely agree that um, this is an area that needs to be addressed and, and, and people need to show leadership, but I just wanna make one sort of nuanced point. Um, I think people need to, to show leadership, but that leadership is leadership of compromise. Um, just like I was talking about some of the patent trial and appeal board disagreements there are, subject matter eligibility has people with very strong disagreements on what the laws should be. And what we really need to do is to have people who are, who are uh, not afraid to, to compromise and find a solution that's good for the country. Because I, I fear that when people hear people like Dave and myself and, and others talk about leadership, they think leadership to push the position I believe in at the cost of, of, of moving forward. And I think we're so passionate about the positions we believe in, I understand that, but sometimes a failure to compromise make, makes us stagnant and, and we don't move forward. And that's exactly what's happened in 101. So I think the more compromise, the better. Um, anyway, uh, to the point about diversity, um, I know that question came in earlier in the Q&A about, uh, you know, why, why is leadership important? Why is innovation important? And, and, and innovation is, is the more innovation we have, it's, it's the, the livelihood of the country. It's the financial well-being and, and the general well-being of the country. So, so I can't understate why it, I can't overstate rather, why it's so important to have uh, innovation throughout the country. And what we're seeing is we're, we're, we're not seeing a wide swath of innovation. Um, we've done some studies show women are underrepresented. We know there's many underrepresented groups. Um, so it is critical for this country to be able to um, expand the, the, the number of people who are uh, innovating from sectors that and underrepresented groups that really haven't been in front of PTO and haven't been uh, innovators in the past. What we're doing at PTO for this, uh, you, and you asked for some concrete steps, uh, we are working on a, a national strategy for uh, increasing uh, innovation to underrepresented groups throughout the country. It's, it's something we're, 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 I'm personally very excited about. I know, Andre, this started uh, with you at the PTO, and I know we had uh, Department of Commerce leadership then, and we have Department of Commerce leadership now for this issue, and we are very excited about uh, moving forward and, and convening the strategy. By the way, the strategy is being worked on and created by a combination of public and private sector people uh, working together. And I know we're, we're running out of time. I'll just mention one more uh, quick uh, uh, way we're addressing this is we've been very cognizant at PTO about where we do our outreach. I mentioned our regional offices, um, but we've actually started to capture by zip code where we're doing outreach to be able to recognize where we are um, uh, not focused, where we should be focused more so that we're letting people who don't have the background in IP learn more about the value of IP because it is for the good of the country. I add just one point, because I think these, it's, it's interesting how these two last topics tie together. Um, there was a, a, a study out of um, uh, Stanford, uh, Mark Lemley and his research assistant analyzed all the Alice cases over about a 10 year period. And their conclusion was that, that those um, groups that were most impacted by uh, Alice disqualifications or 101 disqualifications were individual inventors and individual started inventor started companies. In other words, it's not the you know the the evil patent trolls, or it's not the large corporations who are losing out the most because of the 101 problem. It's those very individual inventors that that the PTO wants to target. Um, and the the other point is as it relates to David's point that that there needs to be leadership from private industry. Part of the problem is that is that uh, Jonathan Barnett has recently uh, written a book that analyzes the incentives uh, to innovate, and he said part of the problem is the largest corporations that that have that are very highly vertically integrated and structured have the ability to substitute for patent protection with other 
um, economies of scale and other other large things, which means that the only innovation we're going to have is is just sort of making the same products we have somewhat better, rather than finding new sparks of genius that that uh, that we need to be looking for. Thank you, Judge O'Malley. We are uh, basically out of time, um, uh, but I want to close with uh, a round uh, of uh, the last thoughts from each one of you. Can be very short. Uh, could be rapid fire. Um, so, uh, last comment or last thought from each one of you, basically answering the top level question of uh, if you had to pick one thing that uh, needs the United States needs to do in order to utilize the intellectual property system to its maximum potential to effect innovation growth and innovation leadership in the United States, what would it be? And I know that we talked about a lot of issues um, and you can say anything you want in your last uh, thoughts. It's just one suggestion. Uh, there's this question from me that you don't have to answer this exactly. But if we can leave the legislators that out there that might be watching this or industry leaders or administrative leaders that might be watching this with an action item, um, what would that be? So, um, uh, let's see. Let me start with uh, uh, in, in in reverse order with uh, with the way we went uh, at the beginning. So let me start with Judge Michel. Andre, I think that the important thing for the country going forward is for Congress to retake its appropriate role as the framer of national innovation and economic policy, and not leave it to the courts who are ill-equipped have not done it well, can't do it well, uh, and it's undemocratic for unelected judges to be making broad economic and innovation policy anyway. So Congress has to uh, take back control uh, jointly with the other so-called political branch of government, the administration, and let the courts adjudicate and not legislate. Thank you, Judge Michel. Dave Kapos. Yeah, thanks, Andre. And I would add to that to say, and on the administration side, we need a national innovation strategy. Thank you, um, Judge O'Malley. Well, I'm going to I'm going to be a little bit more granular because I'd like to think that if I pick pick one thing, we might get it. And I think that we need to do like we did in the trademark context, and we need to change the law as it relates to the right to exclude or better yet, return the law to where it was as it relates to the right to exclude. And I think that's something that Congress could easily do. Right, thank you very much. And finally, uh, Drew. I would say educate, educate, educate. We need to really increase uh, how we educate people. And I'm not just talking about patent lawyers. I'm talking about we need to move IP education and the value of IP way earlier in the process, as early as we can go even to elementary school, we need to build it into the fabric of our of our entire educational process. Uh, thank you so much. Such great thoughts from all of you. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, to be with us and share your, your thoughts. Um, for the two of you currently serving, thank you for your continued service to the United States. Um, for the two of you who uh, served and are now in uh, private practice, thank you for the uh, continued engagement in the IP system and um, and continuing to lead uh, in the innovation uh, economy. Uh, thank you to all the audience and uh, for being with us and once again to CSIS for putting this on. Thanks, Andre. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.